So we are going to our first speaker. I'm really honored to introduce Anat Lechner. She will speak about color design in the age of artificial intelligence. Dr. Anat Lechner is a professor of business at the Stern School of Business, New York University, where she focuses on disruptive innovation and strategic change. She's also the co-founder of Hue Data, the color intelligence company that provides color data and analytics to designers, strategists, and researchers to aid product, brand, and environment design decisions. A former researcher at McKinsey and Company, Dr. Lechner has advised global Fortune 100 firms in the financial services, pharmaceuticals, chemicals, energy, food, technology, design, and retail industries. She has numerous appearances in New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, BBC Time, and other premier global media outlets. And that holds an MBA and a PhD in organization management from Rutgers University, New Jersey. Anat, thank you so much for being with us today, and the screen is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, happy color day to everybody. Uh, as you can see, color unites not just uh, people from all over the world, but also from different professions. So <laughs> it's uh, as exciting and as interesting. I will be talking on uh, color design in the age of artificial intelligence. If you ask yourself, uh, why is she talking about this? Um, I crossed the uh, I'll say crossed over from, from business only to business and color some 25 years ago uh, because I had an event when I was reading something and what I read was um, color is in everything and yet we know so little about it. And that became a very fascinating thing to think about. And with the years, I attempted to know more and more about it and then share my knowledge that I've gained. Uh, a lot of this comes from people like yourself that are part of the professional community and then uh, of the research community. So in this um, quite short talk that was condensed from about an hour to about 30 minutes, uh, I'd like to speak on three um, main ideas. The first one is uh, actually related to artificial intelligence in general and making the claim that it has arrived, which I think, you know, even three months ago, it was more difficult to make this claim. And with all the advancements that uh, this field has made, uh, it's becoming crystal clear. The second is uh, the question of how do we take a field like design and specifically color that is naturally unstructured and then structure it so that we can um, utilize the data to then make different uh, level decisions or different type decisions that are aided with data. And the third one is, uh, we'll call it a use case of uh, using color data to make decisions. And I will show you the platform that uh, we have developed to, to help with that. So going into the first proposition, um, AI is upon us, right? It has arrived. It is entering all realms and the creative realm is included, of course. I asked ChatGPT the other day to talk to me about uh, color. And the question that I asked is which fashion designers um, or which fashion designer has used lots of colors in their designs very basic question, of course, those of you who played with this already know that the question could be more sophisticated and so is the answer. But of course, um, I received an answer and I could have received also the, the images if I wanted and uh, highlighting uh, Pucci's work uh, over the years. So it was quite interesting to see the level of knowledge. When we look at artificial intelligence, um, people are saying we're at the sixth wave of, of technology. By that people mean uh, we've entered the wave of, of robotics, of automation, of digitization. What's interesting about this is it's not just that, but as you can see, if you take 200 plus years view, the waves become shorter, more condensed, and the drama around them in terms of how much change and innovation they bring is uh, becoming increasingly more intense. So we are now in, in, in the stage where this type of technology is coming to aid everything that we do. And people talk about artificial intelligence as um, GPT, which is a general purpose technology, which means once a technology like this arrives, it's in a class of its own, it comes in and it morphs pretty much uh, how we live our lives. And we know this because um, all of us, I think, lived through the internet change and how much change that made uh, to how we function. But I've put here several other examples of uh, such GPTs that have arrived previously 
and how much change they uh, inflicted on our lives. One thing that people are not so much aware of is the scope of this phenomenon and the fact that it's not just mobilized by a few Joes that uh, are in Palo Alto or in uh, Paris, the UK, or whichever other um, center in the world, Shanghai, Tel Aviv. Uh, it's, it's mobilized by strategies that are national strategies. And from the top down, because of national interests, we get to see funding for this, we get to see strategy for this, and then it goes into the industries. So when we ask people in industry, how much AI is now happening in your space, uh, they look at the projects that they're involved in and they say 10, 20% at the most. But when we ask the same people, what about five years from now? Oh, they say, now we're gonna have a lot of AI uh, happening. So people recognize the influence of this. Here is a nice quote to read together. Uh, a Stanford developed AI algorithm for radiology can reliably screen chest x-rays for more than a dozen types of disease and does so in less time than it takes to read the sentence. So uh, AI is entering a profession, that's the level of change that it's making. And when I look at this, uh, I always think of three stages where AI comes in. First one is what's called the augmented intelligence. Uh, the second is the assisted. The highest level is the level of autonomous. When we look at augmented, it's like me going to drive someplace. I enter my car. I say to Waze where I'd like to go. And Waze begins to advise me. In other words, it takes over a, a portion of my responsibility as a driver to just find my way. And it augments me. But then my car sometimes decides to break when I'm a little too fast on the road. And so my car uh, is assisting me in, in living longer, shall we say, and assisting everybody around me, uh, not being uh, impacted by my driving style. So it takes more of an active role. And then of course, we are at the age of autonomous uh, cars that's coming as well. And I showed this to you because I've been thinking on what it is I show here for a good 10 years. And I came to conclude that every profession, and by that I really mean every profession, is undergoing, will undergo, and eventually will become uh, subject to a lot of machine intervention, not to say autonomous, every existing profession. So um, it's, it's a bold statement. We can discuss it later, uh, but uh, I would be relieved in fact to, to hear any one of you thinking on a profession that is not subject to this sequence from augmented to assisted to autonomous, any existing profession. Already we see some deployments. We see the restaurant bot um, that was deployed in, in Beijing. Uh, we see the health bot that was deployed in 2020, uh, in April of 2020, in fact, in, in Italy, which we know what went on then. Uh, and it was very helpful to have it in, in hospitals. The agricultural bot, the hotel bots, the bots that flip burgers, the surgery bots, about 15% of surgeries already are done. Uh, with robotic capabilities, which are governed by data and artificial intelligence. So the fields are becoming more and more. Ray Kurzweil, who is a very interesting uh, person to follow, has made predictions uh, in 1999 about the progress of artificial intelligence. The first one he made was for 2029, which he said, this will be the moment where human intelligence and artificial, artificial intelligence will become equal the machine will come to that level of human intelligence. By 2045, a date he later updated to 2039, uh, AI will surpass human intelligence. And this had become uh, a debated idea in the field of AI, but it's no longer debated. So it's been debated for 20 years on the dates, on the range, on the scope, on the impact. Uh, the artificial com uh, intelligence community no longer debates even the dates. And if, if more, uh, people are now seeing those deployments happening already. And we're in the beginning of 2023. For instance, there was a Google, you might have uh, seen this in the news, uh, a Google engineer that in fact was fired because he published this interaction with the machine with the machine said, um, I sense your excitement, ask me anything. In other words, the machine showed the ability to emote. The machine in, a, in that interaction was presumably uh, sentient. And this is already today, right? In industry, 
We see the travel industry using uh, AI and chat GPT to make travel recommendations. In the legal space, we had core decision now written with uh, chat GPT. In the real estate, people promote listings this way. In the marketing industry, people are putting videos this way. In the education industry, there's a huge debate on how to include ChatGPT in the work of faculty and students and research, of course. Uh, in the lawmaking, uh, there was a guy that wrote um, a legislation in Massachusetts, high Massachusetts, uh, <laughs> just a number of uh, weeks ago. The health industry is using ChatGPT to uh, diagnose. The publishing industry is using it to write articles. The tech industry debrief, debug, um, code and of course the uh, construction industry is is looking to build projects uh, using project management tools from uh, used artificial that use artificial intelligence. This is something unbelievable. A hundred million users that ChatGPT has acquired in uh, two months. And you look at all the other evolutions uh, of, of other technologies that were used to and work with, and look how long it take it took for them to to take off. So the um, appreciation, I'd say, and the inclusion of this technology in our lives is, is just incredible. So you gotta ask yourself, what about the creative process? What about people who are doing creative work? Is AI and the chat GPT of the moment uh, taking over that? And I use here Mark's, Mark Twain's quote where he said at one point, there is no such thing as a new idea, it's impossible. Uh, we simply take a lot of old ideas and put them into a sort of mental kaleidoscope. We give them a turn and then uh, they make new and curious combinations. We keep on turning and making new combinations indefinitely. But they are uh, the same old pieces of colored glass that we have been in use, um, that, have, that have been in use uh, throughout all ages. And I say that because um, I'd like to claim that the creative process behaves exactly this way. We're uh, using inputs that we've received over the years as creatives, and we um, turn the kaleidoscope until we get to a combination that we like. Here is an example where machine comes to aid that. IBM calls um, Simrise, uh, which is a fragrance and flavor house, and they say, can you give us your uh, formulas? And we will um, layer on top of them sales data to see which scent, which uh, perfume uh, worked well in which combination. And uh, very quickly, they're able to design a new perfume that they are then deploying in Brazil and it sells unbelievably well. And the whole process took four months, which usually as you're well aware, is gonna take no short of uh, three to four years to develop a new perfume. So the perfumist, which we have only 3,000 of, of, of them in the world or about, a very creative job is now aided, if not taken, by the machine. Uh, we've seen the first bartender uh, not too long ago that can cook any cocktail that you like for you uh, or make rather, uh, another so-called creative work. We've seen people putting music together and uh, it's quite interesting to see how the machine now is able to discern the, the genre, the capability, the, the, the style, and then put it together into its own music. Um, we've seen this portrait some four years ago, five years ago, sold at Christie's for nearly half a million dollar. And what happened here is they took 15,000 portraits uh, all the way from the 14th to the 20th century. This data, by the way, we have as well in, in new data. And they, they kind of read this and then the machine uh, with uh, capabilities that are part of the, what the AI knows to do, uh, created this portrait. And until it was discriminated from all other portraits in the set, uh, didn't stop. Once it was discriminated, in other words, it became its own thing, it was released. Uh, we've seen that. Uh, some of you may have seen this in person. I've seen this in person, how the AI fixed the night watch uh, over a very tedious process uh, in the, uh, Richt Museum. Uh, we've seen uh, creative uh, um, abstract art being created by machine. Uh, we've seen Philip Stark sitting with Cartel, Autodesk, and the AI, giving the AI the same specs that you would give to a designer, 
and asking the AI to design a new chair. And this is what uh, was designed. It had to be original. It had to be strong. It had to be made of light materials and durable materials. It had to have design sense to it. Le voila. Uh, recently, we've seen the robot uh, chisel that can create, you know, statues just like, uh, I'm not going to go as far as Da Vinci, but, you know, quite nice. Um, We've seen Japanese gardens being created by uh, Deep Dream, which is another AI application. We've seen illustrations happening uh, using DALI and later DALI 2, um, speaking to the machine using language, which the machine now does language to image, as we know, and creating these um, amazingly uh, beautiful, but also uh, accurate representations of the pieces of art in this particular case. Manhattan, the movie of uh, Woody Allen, Pulp Fiction, so forth, in, in 15 seconds. And so in Q1 of 2023, we now have uh, quite a number of what's called generative AI platforms, generative because they are creating new content, they are creating new audio, they are creating new images, they are creating new designs. They are not utilizing data to come up with a deduction and a conclusion. They are creating new pieces of work, just like uh, all creators out there. And of course, the machine can bluff and the machine can go crazy. And it's not to say that the machine is optimal at this stage, but it's to say that the machine has arrived and we're at the beginning of a new age. So what is the second proposition then? You ask yourself, how do we take a field like ours, say the field of color, and um, begin to structure it so that the machine can ingest it, so that the machine can help with making decisions. And when I observe and look at the field of design at large, and of course, color within it, then I see three sets of data that are either needed or already existing. There has to be business data because a lot of the designs we make have to have commercial sense to them. So uh, what are the trends in the business? What's the competitive offering? What are the business goals? This data we usually have. There has to be user data, which people that are dealing with, say, design thinking are specializing there. What are the preferences? What's the uniqueness of the proposition? Uh, what's the consumer behavior? And then there has to be design data. And this is where we fall short. Um, design data relates to what's the shape, what's the form, what's the color, what's the pattern, what are the materials, what are the finishes? This is where the data is not necessarily so abundantly existing if to say that it exists at all. So once upon a time, um, Ralph, Ralph uh, Speth from, from Jaguar said, if you think good design is expensive, you should look at the cost of bad design. And I, I've looked at this thinking, when we don't make um, data-driven decisions, we're prone to more mistakes. Uh, just like the physician is making data-driven decisions and the lawyer is making data-driven decisions and the financial advisor is making uh, data-driven decisions, why do we uh, not have enough data at our disposal to make such decisions? So the challenge is becoming one of um, digitizing the assets that we have, then uh, ingest the data that comes from that digital artifact, then visualize it and then be able to make the predictive modeling and aid the decision process. We started to make progress in the, in the world of materials, especially where people like um, um, material connections and, and others, right? The brain of materials, material archives have uh, now at least digitized all the materials out there that people are using commercially. And these are, as you're well aware, lovely um, capabilities to utilize. We decided that we will come and digitize color and to say that is easy and to do it is insane because color is indeed in everything. So the process that we took on ourselves and by we, I refer to you data, is um, we take an artifact, it might be an image, it might be, so we take, we take a piece of data, shall we say, an image in this particular case of fashion. We take it through the process of um, tagging it so for fashion, what is the year, the designer, the city, the season and so forth. But for the car, it's gonna be the same. And for the perfume, it's gonna be the same. And for a piece of art, it's gonna be the same. And for a logo, it's gonna be the same. Uh, we extract the color. We put it into the color classification that we have. We structure everything. 
we then visualize it and we create a dashboard that helps people inform, get inspired, and then validate uh, their color decisions. That's the intent. And so far we've been doing quite a bit. I'm gonna show you uh, a little bit on the platform itself. Uh, so at this point with database fashion, we have about 1 million data points. It's about uh, 20,000, 22,000 collections over 30 years of everything that's happened in fashion. Um, 2.5 million brands uh, in the home space, in the car space, in virtual reality, we have 17 million colors coming out of 200,000 um, games for all of us who are going to design uh, spaces in the metaverse. Uh, we took art and social media and the legal space that has uh, colors protected sometimes for particular applications with uh, trademarks and patents. Uh, we database nature. We database the names of colors for people who need to name them. And it takes me to the third proposition, which is we need to find a way to then take this data uh, or else what, what are we doing with 30 million uh, color analytics, right? How do we take it and include it into uh, or in the design process to inform, inspire, and validate design decisions? So there are about nine use cases that we've demonstrated on new data that people can use to aid their color design decisions. The first one is the ability to track color trends. Um, we monitor colors in fashion, in cars, and homes. Anytime we have the ability to uh, put a year or a date rather on the color, where was it used, by whom, uh, in which application, uh, it gets ingested into the machine this way. And then we can see the trends over the years of the use of color. This particular view is for the use of uh, color in the ready to wear space and fashion space in 2023. So you can see the comparison across uh, different regions. Um, this is an example where some people want to do competitive analysis of what's happening uh, that the competition is doing, what's happening uh, in the brand space. If you do competitive analysis in that space, what's happening in fashion, cars, homes, and so forth. Uh, again, we can sort through 2.5 million brands and give you a sense of how they work and how they utilize colors. Some people need to name a color. For instance, you worked with this green. What was it named? Was it named before? By whom? Uh, what was it called? So you can uh, take a you know a search database to to get uh, ideas of how people call this color. Alternatively, you may want to work with an attribute. You want to look for colors that communicate the notion of vibe. Well, what might they be? And when you put vibe into the system, uh, it sorts through these eight million colors and give you all the colors that are called vibe. Uh, and you get to see a view like this. Of course, there are more colors in the system, but this is just a snapshot. Uh, we look at color as it's mentioned on, on social media and we can give you a view of what are the colors that are most talked about positively or negatively every day uh, of the year. Uh, we can drill deeper to locations as well, but for now, just very high level presentation here. Uh, those of us who want to get inspired, uh, we took 750 years of art and we ingested it into the machine uh, and, and took a look at the combinations of uh, Henry Matisse or, or any other artists out there. But you can also follow designers from the car space, from the fashion space to see how they are utilizing color and what their color combinations are. These are people that had become color masters for a very good reason, as we know. Um, if you want to rebrand or brand, develop brand identity, uh, and you're considering a specific color, how are you thinking on this? What is your comparison points? Um, we can uh, utilize our brand platform to show uh, competitively how people are using colors. We can tell you the uh, patents that color has in particular application. In this particular case, the color of pen. I don't know if we know that, but here, gray, green, brown, blue, black, are patented or trademarked by certain companies in this particular application. So we don't want to go near these colors or else we'll find ourselves in court. We database the research on color. Um, how many studies on red? What are they most associated with? Uh, who studied? What did they find? And then uh, we just publish a lot of analytics uh, pretty much on a daily basis to uh, share those snippets, those data uh, points with the community 
for the fun of it, and then for just general intelligence, shall we say. Um, I just can take you through one example uh, in the little time that's left for me to show you how life changes when you work with this platform. So many years ago, way before we had you data, um, SAP came to us and the design team said, our C-level executives want to get rid of gold in the logo and we would like to keep it. Can you help us? And we said, and we did the analysis of how gold is used in the technology landscape. Who is using gold? Uh, does it help us stand out? Does it help us blend in? Uh, the design team said that the C-level um, executives want to see blue and blue only. And as you can see, you know, after a lot of tedious work, um, most people actually are using blue and a combination of blue in, in the space. So it doesn't distinguish um, SAP. And so we looked at gold and the use of gold. Uh, we used our color association of the United States data to see if we can find the meaning of gold. We look at statistics. There was a lot of work to just find anything. What does gold communicate? We couldn't always substantiate all these claims. Uh, we did our own studies. It was a lot of work. Four months later, 100 research papers that we reviewed, 50, 50 benchmarked brains that we studied deeply, hundreds of research and analysis hours spent, $50,000 that we charged for this pleasure, we had recommendations for these people. Alternatively, not too long ago, the design team of a defense company came to us and they said, we also want to change the colors of our brain. What do you wanna change them from and to, we asked. They said, well, we have this blue and yellow combination. We wanna make the blue a little darker, make the yellow a little darker and add gray. We also have at the bottom of the screen, as you can see, certain associations that we want the brand to communicate technology, science, upward, collaboration, dialogue, ambition, and so forth. Okay, we put it into our machine. We classify these colors. Is these medium blue, dark blue, medium red, dark, uh, sorry, medium yellow, dark yellow? What, what's the category of color? Which that in itself is proprietary capability we have, which took a long time to develop, delineate the color space. From there, we looked at uh, what's the space doing. This for us is one click away. We don't need to sit there and, and mind as we have it. What's the top 100 companies are doing in terms of their brand identity? We had this view very quickly. We then uh, generated this view to show what are the colors that are used most. So from here, which is just a lot of eyeballing to here, which is now data. We show that uh, dark blue and mid-tone blues are used uh, quite extensively in this industry. Um, we then compare them in terms of, um, you know, detailed view on the most used, on the moderately used, on the least used, used colors in the space. We then said, what are the color combinations? One click away, the color combinations showed. We then said, who's using the combination that they are thinking on? They're thinking on gray and yellow. Who's using this? They're thinking on dark blue and yellow. Who is using that? And we looked at the industries. As you can see, uh, defense and aerospace are not part of these industries, which give these people the ability to differentiate ever so slightly. We then looked at all their um, uh, attributes. And what we saw when the attributes are on the left is that um, none of the colors that they are thinking on are actually associated with the attributes that they are looking for. Most of these attributes are about uh, green, and purple, but not so much about yellow and, uh, and blue. So that was an interesting decision for them to make whether to work with these colors, yes or no. We produced these conclusions, which I'm not gonna bore you with the slide with so many words. And then that took us four hours. We looked at 8,000 brands. We looked at an analysis of the competitive field. Uh, we spent the hours um, um, going through the visualization that we had. We charged 5K and um, that was it. So our platform has uh, the ability to go into fashion, into names, into um, social media, into brands and so forth, as I showed you, and uh, take these analytics, analytics very quickly to be able to um, then come to the conclusion. One of the last examples is we're looking to build the predictive model. Uh, there's a lot of color forecasting that's happening in the field. This is a, a very scientific view here, but where is color going? Are there colors that um, uh, in fashion specifically that are showing together 
are there colors that when gray is showing, um, yellow absolutely does show, but when gray is showing, um, uh, we get to see a whole lot less of cyan. Can we show these um, analytics to then aid the decision on what's coming? So we put a mark next to the color database to just aid uh, the design decision with that data and build this into the field to, to help. My proposition to you is this, the age of AI is arrived. We need to structure the unstructured, which is something that UData is doing to then enhance the color decisions that we're making. It's not gonna make the color decision. It's just going to augment its uh, viability. With that, uh, one last comment. We always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. Thank you so much uh, for uh, listening.